Welcome to the NIS Multipurpose Hall here in our new East Building and to this our first Chubu Perspectives discussion evening. Nagoya pre and post COVID, what to expect from the new normal. The building we're standing in here is the end of a product of a community success story. Nagoya International School was built in the 60s out of a dream for a school that was able to serve the needs of the international community and the economy here in Nagoya. And while that promise to the community has never changed, the need for our school to invest in the kinds of facilities and programs necessary has only ever become stronger. And our community here in Nagoya have always understood this and sensing our need for help when we reached out for support in the form of our 2020 Vision fundraising campaign, that support came flooding in. Close to 350 million yen raised, our donors included over 300 individuals and families, over 100 separate local and international companies, and almost 100 current staff. The backing of the economic federations of the Chukai Ren, the Nagoya Chamber, the Doyukai, the Aikeikyo, and the ACCJ, along with significant contributions from both the city and the prefectural governments, have turned our 2020 vision into reality. Thanks to Chubu, our campus can now deliver the kind of quality education to be found in any other city in Japan, or for that matter, any major international city in the world. Thanks to the support of Chubu, we have been able to build the kind of school which our students deserve, our parents expect, and our city needs. Having received such incredible community support, it was important for us to find ways to give back. We wanted to ensure that NIS remained a center for progressive thought and connection here in this region. And one of the ways that we want to do that is by using this wonderful space as a venue for dialogue, for ideas, for inspiration, and for impact. And so tonight, we have the first of what we hope will be many in a series of such evenings, these Chubu Perspectives ideas. Unfortunately, COVID means we don't have the audience we would quite like to have today, so most of you will be experiencing this through video. However, just as the topic this evening suggests, uh, we start with optimism and hope of a new normal for the future. And that is the topic, and that's what we're going to be discussing. And I would like to invite our three um, distinguished panelists this evening and thank them uh, for contributing to this, our discussion. In alphabetical order, our first panelist this evening is Ney Bittencourt, who is the Consul General of Brazil. Ney started his diplomatic career in 1984, and he has held posts in Warsaw, Barcelona, Tokyo, London, Washington DC, and Maputo. Before coming to Japan, he served as the ambassador to Cameroon. However, Japan is his second most lived in country, after Brazil, of course. Welcome, Ney. Our second panelist this evening is Chenier Lasalle, who serves as the Consul and Senior Trade Commissioner at the Consulate of Canada in Nagoya. Before joining Global Affairs Canada in 2010, Chenier was Vice President of the Canada Beef Export Federation and has also worked in the private sector and as Trade Director for Japan with the Provincial Government of Alberta. Again, welcome, Chenier. Bonsoir. Our final panelist is Gary Schaefer, Principal Office at the US Consulate in Nagoya. Gary joined the State Department in 2005 following a career as a journalist. And during his 16 years as a diplomat, he has been posted to Washington, Tokyo, Baghdad, Osaka, and Warsaw. Welcome, Gary. Our moderator this evening will be Chris Savokowitz. Chris currently serves as the Vice Chairman of the NAS Board of Directors, and he is also the leader of the Board's Development Committee. He's also a board member with the Japan America Society and an active member on the ACCJ. And when he's not volunteering in these roles, Chris serves as the president of Caesars International. Thank you for guiding our discussion this evening, Chris. I'd like to invite you up to the podium to lead what I know will be a very insightful and exciting discussion. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Matthew. As a board member and a parent of the school, it really is an honor and a privilege to have the opportunity to moderate this event. All three panel members will have five minutes to answer each question, and we'll have the opportunity for discussion afterwards as well. So without further ado, let's get right into the first question. This will be for Gary. It seems so long ago now, but until the pandemic, tourism was considered a growth industry in Japan as well as Chubu. Will it ever be the same? Chris, thanks for throwing the hardest question uh, my way right from the get-go. Um, 
tourism uh, will be an important part of the economy going forward, I think, but not in the same form that we've seen until now. Uh, I think the trend was less pronounced here in Chuba than in other parts of Japan, uh, like Osaka or Tokyo, but there was a definite dependence here on uh, group tourism, I think, from, from China. And um, I think that model may not prove viable going forward. And so as we see a return to normal in some of the, uh, the United States, Europe, and other countries, I think there's also going to be a redefinition here in Chuba in the tourism industry of a, a sort of a sustainable model, for lack of a better uh, term, not in, this, in the environmental sense, but in the sense uh, of having perhaps your risk more distributed over different markets, uh, perhaps a greater focus on individual tourism versus group. And uh, even before COVID, I had heard from uh, different uh, contacts and places, you know, some of the, the well-known tourist attractions here saying, you know, I think we're, we're putting all of our eggs in one basket. We really do need to make greater outreach to some of these other markets, including individual travelers, say from the United States or from Europe. So tourism, yes, in the same form uh, until now, no. That, that, that would be my uh, sort of take on it. Sinead, what do you think? Uh, I'm obviously not a specialist on, on vaccines and a medical one, but what I'm seeing right now in the news, uh, and most, most of us are seeing the same thing, uh, makes me optimistic. Uh, I'm, se I'm seeing parts of the U.S. reopen. Gary can probably speak uh, to it better than me. I'm seeing parts of my own country, Canada. People are saying that cities uh, like Montreal or Quebec City in June would be uh, pretty much open to, to normal businesses, restaurants, and things reopening because of the, va of the vaccines. And if you extrapolate, uh, this can only reach Japan at some point. So we're talking maybe a year from now, it'll start to seem relatively normal, not completely. Uh, but, or it could happen a bit sooner in some parts of the world, maybe in Japan a bit later. Uh, I am also optimistic about uh, the prospects of tourism here recovering. Uh, it will not be uh, soon. It, it may be different, but uh, uh, even the difference may not be so wide and so deep. I, I don't know how much Chubu is, is a this a final destination on itself as much as as a, a a hub to serve other areas which are really important for for japanese tourism like kyoto and here close to 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 nagoya you have also nara you, you have access to osaka i, I mean nagoya and, and in general chubu is very well situated in japan in terms of access to this tourist uh, areas. The other question I would ask is how imp important is tourism for Aichi, for instance? Aichi is really not so much into tourism. It's, it's a production center. Uh, 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 industrial uh, uh, production is, is the main uh, uh, activity here. So I, I think it will play a part, but it, it's not the, the whole, uh, it's not what uh, Chubu needs only tourism. Can I jump on that? Yeah, I think that, um, of course, I, I agree with Nay's assessment. This this is essentially a industrial economy. But what I say everywhere is that, you know, in speeches and, and in the press, is that Nagoya and the rest of Aichi has tremendous potential as a tourist destination. Not only as a jumping off point, which of course is is an important selling point. It's centrality, but um, there's so much uh, sort of undiscovered gems here, and, and so it's really incumbent upon, I think, the, the, the industry here to, to sell itself better, to do a better job of, of marketing itself. I think all of us would agree that there are some incredible places to visit here, um, but that maybe Aichi Prefecture and Nagoya have not done the greatest job of, of you know, getting the, the word out there. Uh, the region is building its tourism infrastructure. It's got a few things that it can highlight, and it's going it's a few more will be coming online. I think uh, there's room for a third hub, and the, the hub could be Nagoya. You would have Ghibli Park. You would have uh, possibly at some point, although that becomes political, uh, a new uh, a new cast Nagoya Castle. Yeah, you've got interesting things, interesting things like Osu, but not too far. Just a uh, 40 minutes away, you've got Kyoto. So, so you can go to Kyoto from, from Nagoya. You can see these picture postcard cities like Shirak Shirakabago and Hidatakayama. Uh, it's got a lot to offer. 
Great. I think that um, actually brings us to uh, our second question. Um, it's often been said that Aichi wasn't getting its fair share of international tourism dollars, which I think we're, we're touching on now. Not enough foreign tourists were coming here. As foreigners, what are some ideas you could share with Aichi and Chubu to bring more tourists to the region? And I, I think you've, you've kind of just shared a few of them. Are, are there any more uh, thoughts that you have on this idea? Well, the, the, the hub, selling Nagoya as a hub, uh, not being afraid to maybe sell things like osu a little more aggressively. I find it very interesting uh, to have a bit of a concentration of uh, an Akihabara and uh, another more historical part, all centered into one little part of the city around a temple like osu Kanno. Uh, I find that very appealing. Uh, Kyoto is very, very, uh, very, very close and people don't realize it. You hop on a Shinkansen and you're there in 40 minutes. Uh, it, it can it can be turned into a hub. Uh, the work just needs to be done. Yeah, I I, I totally agree with that. I think uh, there's some work to be done. Uh, the idea of a, a hub is totally pertinent in my opinion. I think Nagoya, Chubu, and Aichi are very well placed to to provide services for the tourist industry in Japan. And uh, some investment in Nagoya will certainly uh, provide returns. Uh, I, I think the, the, the refurbishment of the, of the castle is very important. Uh, there are many other pearls that are not so uh, uh, well pu publicized. So yeah, I see a lot of pu future in this area. I agree with them. Uh, yeah, I think one issue is that we have a lot of disparate parts here that haven't necessarily been knitted together into a coherent whole. If you go to Paris, you can buy a, you know, an all-Paris ticket that gets you into every attraction. Why can't I buy, say, a single ticket here that would get me into Nagoya Castle, also a, a you know, day trip to Shirakawa Go, all these things sort of you know, link them together from a marketing point of view, that's one thing. Uh, how about a, sort of a, a marketing concept? Are we in Chubu? Are we in Tokai? Are we in Central Japan? What are we going to call it? How can we market it? I always think of, you know, Malaysia Truly Asia, a really snappy uh, concept that went, you know, viral before there was going viral on CNN and that, that kind of thing. Wow, what, what if we had that for here? Um, and the final thing is I remember um, one of the tourist boards approaching me and showing me some clips that they had put together for, for tourists, and I was struck by the, uh, the fact that all of them the the uh, the tours that they were proposing all relied heavily on say renting a car you know and that that's really not practical i think for the average tourist is going to get in a car and drive to the backwoods of 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 um, gifu or mie or wherever and this goes back to that question of of rebuilding or refocusing the model of tourism here so could there be more public transport infrastructure that would get individual tourists from some of these countries out to some of these places those are my thoughts the COVID pandemic has had a crippling effect not only on the travel industry, it has also hit Mitsubishi's MRJ space jet program based largely here in Nagoya. Could you share your forecast on the aerospace industry as a whole and on the Mitsubishi program in specific? Thank you, Chris. Uh, well, w w one, uh, one thing, one phenomenon I observed uh, concerning the, the, the effects of the pandemic was that uh, the sectors of the economy were affected very differently. And th th their recovery times will var vary a lot. Uh, some even have benefited, and we forget that. M many, well, uh, uh, m medical equipment, Vac vaccines, ma many uh, and many others related for uh, uh, to to home work, for instance. M many sectors have benefited from that and developed new solutions. We have new new uh, uh, applications, so uh, uh, it, it's a very differentiated impact. And I think that unfortunately, aviation uh, airspace is one of, of the wor worst hit industries. Uh, uh, in, in, in these times. Uh, besides, well, it, it's a high investment economy. 
uh, uh, it, it's, it moves huge amounts of, of, of finance. Uh, maturing of the projects is very long, demands a lot of time. So, um, and finally, it's, it's the end of a, a chain of other uh, sectors of the economy. For, for companies to, to, to start producing airplanes, they, they need demand. Demand needs people traveling, needs tourism. So first, these sectors of the economy must recover until uh, uh, it escalates to, to, to the top and, and most difficult uh, uh, segments of this, this chain, which is airspace industry. So I, I, I am afraid, in my opinion, it may take some time until there's a full recovery. I believe it will recover. But the other challenge I see concerning airspace industry is what, what's happening now in Europe, where first, uh, I think, uh, it was the UK, no, it was France that uh, limited short flights, short flights, short domestic flights. They, are, they have been canceled in, in France. So environmental matters will affect airspace industry too will affect the kind of, of planes that will be demanded. And I think this is a very big challenge for, for this industry. Thanks, Nay. Gary? Yeah, I, I think, well, I agree, of course, with Nay's assessment about commercial aviation um, here in Nagoya. And of course, all of us here, I think, are looking at this through a, a Chubu lens or a Nagoya lens. Um, we still have incredible uh, cooperation going on between the United States and Japan. Notably, uh, the F-35 uh, Lightning is being assembled here uh, in Nagoya under license from Lockheed. That program is going forward. In fact, now uh, this uh, Nagoya has become a regional hub for maintenance uh, of such aircraft. And of course, you've all seen that Mitsubishi uh, Heavy Industries was uh, selected by the Ministry of Defense as the prime contractor on the next generation Japanese fighter, which means that will be built here as well. So I think all of us are uh, thinking about maybe implications for uh, expats being here and um, perhaps you know with their, bringing their, their their kids with them uh, and and the impact on the student body at NIS and and so on and so forth. But so I don't think we just need to look at maybe the situation on the commercial side. Let's remember that there's a whole another um, piece of this pie that that is actually growing now. And besides that, I would also point out that uh, we, I think sometimes we tend to leave out of this conversation uh, next generation mobility. I was just at a conference a couple weeks ago and there was an incredible, a pair of incredible presentations by uh, companies here in IT Prefecture One, which is developing a, a flying car, right? You've heard this term urban air mobility, basically sort of a, a, a scaled down one person helicopter. And then another company which uh, is doing incredible work on drones. There's neat stuff just around the corner that's you know either being commercialized or on the cusp thereof. And I think that's gonna drive a lot of growth here as well. So let's not forget about that piece. So you're pretty optimistic that the future is, is looking bright and will make a comeback. I do. I'm maybe not necessarily on the commercial side for the reasons that Nay, I think, elaborated very cogently, but uh, for, on these, some of these other places, I think we can, we can expect some exciting growth. Great. Shinya? Yes. Uh, if, we, if I go back to the space jet program, what are my prognostics for it? I, I think, of course, you have a company, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, uh, leading Japan's effort at getting back into the civil, civil aviation market. But you, you also feel that it's the country behind it. It's a national project. So I don't think, uh, if it's on the rocks temporarily, I don't, I don't think it'll stay there. It will come back when the market means that it makes sense to, to bring it back. And the signs I see from that market right now are fairly positive. Uh, so when that kicks in, when things start to look normal in the U.S., you will, you will, I imagine that you'll start to see and hear people talk about uh, the program and uh, the uh, space jet program and bringing it, uh, uh, bringing it back online in earnest. Uh, that, that's what I think will happen. Thank you all for those comments on the aerospace industry in the Chibu area. So from your perspective, what does Aichi industry do well? What fields or sectors could it do better at? What are some suggestions and ideas you could offer Aichi in terms of long-term economic development? Well, I think there's a growing consensus in Aichi Nagoya that it's uh, all about innovation, right? 
This is a, a region that has an incredible track record in terms of manufacturing, but the dominant ethos has always been Kaizen, right? Gradual improvement. We'll make something, make it a little better. And Tokyo has, perf uh, excuse me, Toyota has perfected that model. But as, as we, somebody mentioned earlier, we're now looking at a, you know, a once in a century, you know, once in a lifetime sort of change, uh, sea change in the automotive industry. And maybe now it's the, the emphasis has to be on innovation. And you know, to the credit, I think the business community here and the uh, local government has realized that. And we've seen just, and I've been struck by this in the last two or three years, the, the amount of emphasis that's being placed on uh, finding ways to support entrepreneurship, startups, and innovation. So we have several, I think, concrete tokens of that. We've seen both the city of Nagoya and Aichi Prefecture have teamed up with a business to set up these incubators. You've seen uh, one is Nagano, uh, Nagano Campus, and there's another one, uh, Innovators Garage, right? And then we have AI Station, which is going to be coming on board, I think, next year. It was delayed a little bit by COVID. But we have really people anteing up, you know, putting down money and sort of in, in bricks and mortar here, putting up these these uh, these efforts to I don't want to say manufacture innovation, but to find a way to stimulate you know innovation like never before. I have another idea which is totally different from from the, the, the this manufacturing uh, uh, power here is sometimes people asked me and and, and, and commented how Nagoya lacked something to to. to a certain appeal that is very important for tourism too, that you you feel in most very famous cities. It's a charm, something different. And then I started to guess, try to guess what creates this. And and my my idea for it was that you need some something bohemian. The, 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 the cities like Paris, they have something about arts, about a little niche. You go to Tokyo, the, the, in the 90s, I remember, there was Takada no Baba and some other places. What, what, what's creating this atmosphere? Students, it's universities. Around these this, uh, uh, places, around the universities, you have little wards where people gather, they make theater, music, bands, and, and, uh, and this creates the, the, this special atmosphere, this charm, this thing that is invisible, immaterial, that, that you, you enjoy so much, and, and it, it spreads. I think if I, I, I had the power, if, if I would choose something to change and to create difference in Nagoya, I, I would really try to, to find a way to uh, Awaken this 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 kind of atmosphere in the city, M more modernism, a, a little bit of a bit of transgression. Uh, 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 Nagoya is still conventional; it's still uh, per dictated by by the idea of, of organization of work, of uh, uh, rules, of processes. It, it needs to 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 be more to be cool, to have some swagger. So I I, I think. That, that's one one area. Think about uh, a bit of about arts to to create soul, to bring soul to to, to Nagoya. I think that this is something that I would like to tell people here. Shinji, haven't you written about making Nagoya cool? Yes. Uh, to go back to the incubator and accelerators, Nagoya is finally getting on board and uh, and r r raising its own uh, large-scale incubators and putting a lot of money behind it. And it's a good thing. It's essential, and they needed to do that. But it's probably not going to change the landscape in in uh, in the city. Uh, it's an industrial city. Uh, the budgets of companies like Denso and Toyota the, for, for R&D are in the billions of dollars. So you're not necessarily counting on these new ventures to come up with, uh, with fantastic ideas that are re going to revolutionize the auto industry. Those ideas will probably come from Toyota Denso Labs and, and possibly from other places around the world that Toyota can quickly get access to. If it's coming from Silicon Valley or California, they can go there. Uh, you, I'm not expecting a new Silicon Valley to rise in Aichi. So, uh, so it's good to have it, 
but it's probably not going to change the landscape. Something that would change the landscape and make it more a bit more creative and artistic while potentially uh, helping raise a new generation of creative entrepreneurs that might come up with a new uh, online shopping app or, or, or a new business altogether would be to have a critical mass of IT venture capital. And one of the ways to do it, of course, is these accelerators. But another way would be to raise a creative industry intentionally. And one thing I've seen done in my own country and, and in my own home city, uh, hometown was uh, in Montreal, where they built a video game industry from scratch. Uh, and that made it uh, into the, one of the top five concentration of gaming studios in, in the world behind cities like New York, Tokyo, or, or what have you. And then you've got Montreal number five. What this does is not necessarily, not just uh, give you an industry with about 15,000 people working for the video game industry. It's a school for, for, the, for IT venture capitalists in the city. They learn how to deal with uh, basic uh, artificial intelligence because in video games, things don't move uh, robotically. They, they try to give them a bit of personality so, so that it's more interactive. So you learn your basics in AI. You learn 3D graphics. Now you're probably going to learn a virtual reality because of the next level of gaming. All that uh, in, in a business that a lot of people are attracted to and want to work in and will settle for a, a measly salary for the five, first five or ten years of their career just because it's fun. And these people, the, the cream of the crop, become the people who start these interesting new businesses. If it's not a, a IT sales, uh, a, new, a new IT business, uh, sorry, sorry, an, uh, an internet sales business, uh, a new service, a new app, et cetera. These people who were schooled in a fun, attractive industry uh, end up being uh, creators of new businesses. So, so my, and then that'll be my, the last thing I, I, I add. Uh, a good thing that IT could do is attract two or three of these major, well, I gave the example of video games, but maybe it's another one. Two or three big companies that employ, you know, 1,000, uh, 2,000, or 3,000 in, in, uh, in a future-proof uh, industry like IT. The cre a creative one would be interesting because it would also add a bit of that bohemian uh, quality to, to, to the city because young people, the, the video game industry is by, by definition young. Uh, and people have sort of young tastes. Uh, when they when they can't find what they're looking for, they generally create it. Uh, they create new bars, new restaurants, uh, and their tastes are eclectic. Uh, so, so that would be an, an interesting solution. Attracting a few, two or three anchor companies, and even if they're foreign, uh, to to help uh, the rise of a new generation of creators and entrepreneurs might be an interesting solution for uh, an interesting idea for them to to explore. And that was achieved in Montreal through, was it tax incentives or what was the impetus? It was a mix of tax incentives and also attracting a major studio to Montreal. The first that was a studio they attracted was Ubisoft, which is possibly the leading game design company in the world, a French company. Uh, their first, when they first arrived in the city, it was 50, 50 people. Now they're up to uh, 3,000, if I'm not mistaken. It's probably the biggest gaming studio in the world, in Montreal. And also tax credit. Uh, the certain positions, not your administrators, but the creators, interestingly, a certain percentage of their salary up to uh, a certain amount uh, would be uh, subsidized uh, by, by tax credits from, uh, from the government of, of Quebec. So I'm curious, based on what... Aichi or Chubu has to offer in terms of resources, what kind of industry do you think could be pulled here or developed? I, I had an idea, and, and these companies exist in Japan. Uh, they're IT consulting firms, and some of them can employ tens of thousands of people, and, and it's literally your Toyota, and you want advice on how to, uh, how, how to manage your internal software that handles whatever part of the process and you go to them and they help you design something and they get their programmers on it and they offer you solutions. I was surprised to see that uh, the big clients like Toyota or Denso had to go to, uh, to, to Tokyo or, or to Osaka to, to find those services. They probably have a little hub in, in IT as well, of course. But none of them are headquartered here. I find it interesting. You've got an industrial hub. So if you've got IT solutions tailored to uh, an ind industrial clientele, why isn't the headquarter uh, in, in, uh, in IT? And why doesn't this headquarter in, in IT 
then not expand into into companies wherever there's a Japanese presence, and then eventually have clients in in Thailand, in China, or where the expertise can be developed here and then exported uh, through. Uh, through their network of, of uh, networks of programmers, but also through acquiring brains in other countries as well. Oh yeah, just a couple of thoughts on 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 what Shenyi just said. Um, I remember uh, talking to uh, some HR folks at a large manufacturer here in Aichi, and the company had recently opened a new lab, but they'd done so in Tokyo. And of course, I asked why, and they said, "Well, we didn't, we just couldn't have gotten together enough, you know, world class, you know, scientists here in Aichi." And so, I mean, so that was a real epiphany or a really striking moment and that goes back to some of the things that we've talked about earlier about making the city more attractive building up the educational resources right if we don't have if we're not churning out the kind of young person that's gonna you know do these kinds of cutting edge research jobs then the companies aren't going to locate the, their laboratories here still though optimistic note i think things are changing last year uh the the fastest growing startup in japan was actually from nagoya and it was a company that developed software to uh regulate workflow inside the company so which i'm sure they're doing fantastic business now with covid but still the reality as as i saw with my own eyes is big companies saying yeah we probably couldn't get folks from around the world to locate here right now it would be a too tough of a sell um in interestingly enough you've all come back to japan a second time after a period of years initially what are some of the big changes you noticed in your second time around? And what do you think will be a big change in the next 10 to 15 years from now? Shenye? Very interesting question. Uh, when I came back, there were different stages to, to my perception of what had changed, what, what hadn't. There were things that I noticed fairly quickly and things that took a bit more time for me to notice. One of the first things I noticed was the, the number of foreigners. Uh, had increased. Uh, I remember in the 90s when I was here, there were uh, there was a, a Brazilian Japanese community that, that was starting to, to to come in and to work in Japanese plants. But now the presence was more visible. Uh, if you if you went to a convenience store, chances were that you'd be served by by someone who wasn't Japanese and, and was very noticeable. Where you know and you know convenience stores are ubiquitous. Uh, you see them at uh, almost at every corner, uh, which means you you get a, a chance to chat with uh, with uh, foreigners uh, on a on a daily basis. That was a big change. So, so the, what was something kind of looming, uh, the, the, the fact that there were fewer, Japanese were having fewer children and, and would, would need to rely on foreign workers uh, in, was, was kind of looming in the 90s. It was, was, was now the state of, of things. Uh, Japan needed uh, foreign workers and it was visible in the city. Another thing I noticed, that one's a bit more esoteric. I noticed it after maybe a six months to a year. I got the feeling that Aichi wa was in a more powerful position inside Japan than in the past. The centers of power felt more like, uh, like Tokyo, of course, uh, with some in the Kansai. But now Aichi is mentioned al along with those other big centers more than it was when I was in, in the 90s. In, in the future, a challenge uh, in the next 10 to 20 years from now. Well, it'll be like uh, the rest of Japan keeping their factories humming uh, while dealing with uh, f with a, a dwindling population. Not dwindling, I'm exaggerating a little, but while dealing with, uh, with some labor shortages. So integrating some of the foreigners into their workforce, uh, even more so than, than they are now, will be uh, something that IT will have to tackle in, in the future. I'll stop there. I think Japanese society changes very s slowly. I I it is like... It is, it is in a way hostage of its own success because many things work fine in Japan. The, the challengers here are never dramatic. They, they have problems. There are problems in Japan like in any other uh, uh, country, any other society, but things are basically harmonious. There's a tremendous attachment to harmony, to, to, to uh, a coexistence, peaceful way of avoiding conflict. So uh, I think they don't change uh, uh, as quickly as they themselves s desire or, or express or say they desire. I remember in the 90s, there was a big discussion o on changing the education system because they needed creativity. It was the 90s globalization and... Uh, 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 it was a surge of, of the, the, the high-tech companies. 
And they said, we need people to, we, to, to compete in this market. We need crea creative people. We have to change our, the mentality of the Japanese people. They have to be more, less uh, attached to hierarchy and, and bureaucratic processes. And uh, it, it has not changed as much as we, we could expect. Uh, it's a kind of a, of a <laughs> common saying here. The pe people are very surprised to see how, how much fax machines are still used in Japan. So, <laughs> so this, this was in, in the prime minister's uh, uh, speech last year. So it, it's, it, it is interesting that Japan doesn't change very fast. And it works fine. The, the country is well, is well established, is well is stable. I think it's far more stable than what we have seen in the last years in, in the West, in Western countries. So uh, yeah, it has a, its own pace. It, I think Japan finds its own way to change. I think that's a really good point. My, one of my favorite sayings about Japan is that there's no such thing as revolution, only evolution. So, Gary, how about you? Well, I think we all three came to Japan for the first time in the same era, so it doesn't surprise me, I guess, that our impressions, our, our takeaways are so similar. Definitely agree. Uh, for me, just the face of, of, of Japanese retail having changed this way when you go into a convenience store and nine times out of ten in Nagoya, uh, the person behind the register is, is not Japanese. I never thought that. I mean, I remember, of course, in, in the factories we had large numbers of Brazilian, Japanese, Peruvian, Japanese, but that, that you know, these that foreigners would then become the face of, of that particular business. I did not see that coming. Um, and and uh, regarding Shinji's impression that Aichi, you know, cuts a, a larger, uh, higher profile now in national politics or in terms of the economy, I mean, there's, there are numbers that back that up. So I, for me, a, a huge turning point. Right when I got here, um, the data was for fiscal 2016 in Japan, and the data always lags. But for that year, uh, Aichi's gross regional product surpassed Osaka's for the first time. So we always think of everything in Japan as being one, two, three, Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, but, but suddenly the, the order was reversed. So we have seen a surge economically here. Obviously, everyone's sort of now taken a hit because of COVID. But yes, definitely, I think a changing of the guard economically among the regions in Japan. And I, and I do think that that trend will be reinforced by the arrival of the maglev in 2027, suddenly making you know, Nagoya more convenient, really, than any place else in Japan. And, you know, there has been a lot of talk about, and this, this speaks to the, the second part of the question about the big change in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, there has been a lot of talk about the, the people who are going to, the communities that are going to benefit from folks wanting to move out of the Tokyos or the Osakas. Um, I don't believe that means that people are all going to go try to find a, a, a home in a town of 5,000 people. I think it's going to be the mid-sized places like Aichi that offer the best balance of you know, less population density on the one hand, but also convenience, you know, all, uh, the connections and everything. So I, I think uh, uh, Nagoya is very, very well placed to be a winner from COVID. Maybe I'm anticipating your next question. But the other big change I think in the next 10 to 20 years here is going to be the core industry, the automotive industry, right? I mean, that even dwarfs aviation. And here we're looking at a once in a, you know, as, as Mr. Toyota is wont to say, you know, once in a, in a, in a lifetime change from from gasoline powered vehicles to electric vehicles that's going to uh, sort of flow through the entire um, you know industrial uh, mechanism here so all, not only Toyota and, and the and the OEMs the producers but also their suppliers so um, yeah we're, we're on the cusp of a sea change here in the biggest industry in IHE prefecture and I again I just to go back to this uh, event I, I attended about next generation mobility a couple weeks ago I was very encouraged to see some of the stuff that even you know startups are doing in autonomous driving um, electric vehicles there's a lot of cool stuff that maybe isn't always reported say outside the financial press but that's going on here in, in Aichi, so I'm very encouraged on that score. When I arrived here in 2016, I, one of the first things I noticed, as Gary did, was, was the fact that the industry was reinventing itself, the, the automobile industry. And at its center, of course, where the future is electric, but also the future is IT, you know, autonomous driving, uh, intelligent cars, basically, that are linked through, through some, some, some networks, etc. And, and the pace of change 
is so fast that until now, what had been done in-house almost exclusively by these companies like Toyotas and Densos, uh, could, most of it could probably still be done in-house. But things were happening so fast that it was, it was in their interest to reach out and see what these uh, uh, interesting venture companies had to offer, much more than in the past. So the, the links uh, between Aichi and foreign technology, which might, in, which might mean at some point foreign labor, but the, high, the highly specialized foreign labor, uh, might take a, an even bigger role in, in the future of Aichi. Nay, what do you think? Uh, when I was thinking about this, this conversation today uh, beforehand, I, I tried to find, uh, I mean, speculate a little bit about these questions. And two things came to my mind, which I think is, are uh, uh, concerned in, in what uh, Gary and Chenier said. is one, environmental matters and uh, technology, innovation. Because uh, in, in, a, in a region, especially in Aichi, where you have such a huge production capacity, the difference between Aichi and the rest of Japan, and, and even Kanagawa, uh, Yokohama, is so immense be because of its industries, that th the potential for investment, if you drive all that power to innovation, uh, technology in all sectors, but especially in transform, automotive, uh, 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 railways, uh, with a focus on, on something which is inevitable, which is uh, uh, environmental matters. And then you have all the, the, the innovation that can come about with uh, applications, with, with uh, uh, students providing any sort of services around all this, the, all this economy, all this industry. This, this is a huge potential. And I think this is important, especially for an institution like uh, uh, an international school, like Nagoya International School, because this is where the education system will play a very important role, is to train and uh, uh, form the, the people, the young people, the young engineers, the, 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 the youth that will drive these this, this changes. We, we talk about change. So this, is, this may happen. And, and I think that Chubu, Aichi, and Nagoya are very well placed to drive this investment, these changes in Japan. Yeah, I've been in Japan now for uh, almost 30 years um, straight through. Haven't had a chance to leave like you guys, but have noticed um, just a, an increase in internationalization and um, especially in the, in the areas that I particularly work in, which is food service um, and food in general, just how that's changed over the years with um, companies like Costco coming into the area and um, just the opportunity to have more available. Metro is another company that uh, has recently come into Japan. So that's been a, a big change from my aspect. H have there been any other, you've mentioned auto and you've mentioned aerospace, IT. H have you seen any other big changes or do you anticipate anything else? When I first came to Japan in 1990, there were no self-service gas stations. Wasn't allowed, right? It wasn't until we had deregulation later that people were allowed to fill their own, you know, gas. But y y we've seen over time that, that that price and sort of a global standard has really reshaped. Uh, I mean, so much of 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 the way you know business is done in Japan, and now I, I never foresaw a time when you would ha go to the to the grocery store and there'd be all those self service registers. I mean, because Japanese people liked service, and that stuff is actually kind of going to a global model now. And I think COVID, if anything, has uh, accelerated that. Now you can get takeout food anywhere. I was my, my sort of pivotal moment a couple of weeks ago. I was at a restaurant and finished my meal, and it was it was wonderful. It was actually Thai food. Couldn't quite finish it all. And the woman came up to me and asked me if I wanted to put the, the remainder in a little, you know, plastic thing to take home. Suddenly, you know, uh, everyone's mentality has been changed. We'll try anything now. So I, I just been struck by, you know, the self-service, you know, the, 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 the emphasis on price versus, you know, doing the, the, the fancy presentation and then things that just weren't possible for suddenly because of COVID and, and the new reality have become possible.
in five years time from now, how will you explain your time in this area? Like what kind of things will you tell people about your time in Aichi? Ne? Well, it was really exceptional because of the pandemics. We lived a very particular time. Uh, I, I don't think it, it's a positive, uh, but it, it taught a lot of things. It brought new ways of gathering people. It changed a lot, changed a lot our, our routine, our daily life. Um, it will certainly mark the, 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 these four years that I have lived here. Two, two of them under this this uh, particular situation so i i don't think it's it's the best lapse of time to to judge w what will happen in in the n next 5 years it was a very exceptional time what i bring with me is an immense uh sympathy uh, and empathy with Japan. I, I like Japan. I, I, I increased my attachment to this country. Great, thank you. Shani? Well, there are so many things uh, beyond the fact that it'll become memorable just because uh, it was during a pandemic. Uh, it's some of the first impressions that, that I mentioned will be even more memorable. Uh, I arrived here and noticed that the automobile industry was reinventing itself around IT and all that, uh, and AI, which was a Canadian strength. Uh, so being able to, to help uh, make connections between Japan and Canada was a great pleasure. And then there was a, an investment by Denso in an AI R&D center in Montreal. Then uh, you had uh, the rebirth uh, of uh, the civil aviation sector, uh, the partnerships between uh, Mitsubishi and and again, Canada were strong. Mitsubishi had just announced the establishment of an R&D center in Montreal that was to employ 300 people, and then COVID hit. But just to be part of, of crea helping create links between Aichi and Canada was a great pleasure. Uh, beyond that, there was something personal. My wife is from the region. She's from Seto. And, and I went to university in, uh, in Nagoya in the 90s. When I first came here, it was to attend Nanzan University for a year, and then I, I, I did a master's degree at Nagoya University. So I was coming back to my wife hometown to a city uh, where that I'd lived uh, in uh, in for seven years in the 90s so it was the best posting I could expect in uh, in professional in terms of uh, of work uh, and on a personal level it was it was the best posting I could imagine and then came COVID but hey it makes it even more memorable I guess is uh, the best way to look at it this has been a fantastic uh, four years for me in my case four years both personally and professionally, uh, I was I almost felt like this was uh, I was in Japanese say it's you know destiny. Um, you know, you said your wife was from Nagoya. Um, so the, 30 years ago, the very first place I, I visited in Japan when I was a, a new college graduate and had signed up for the jet program, I was assigned to a small school in Gifu Prefecture. So you can imagine 30 years ago, I never dreamed that I would be coming back here in 2017 as the U.S. representative to, you know, Aichi, Gifumie, and, and Shizuoka. So that was just amazing. And then getting to go back to that town, and uh, I gave a presentation to the kids, I think it was the day before graduation, and I, I did a, a riff on the old thing about you, you, you can't come home again or whatever. You know, I said, in fact, you can come home again. Um, it was just, um, and I just felt so connected to this region. You know, the very first katsu, you know, tonkatsu I ever had was miso katsu, right? And so, you know, all that kind of stuff, that, that sort of, that local knowledge, getting to use that uh, in this context. Another thing, um, our consulate turned 100 last year. Being here for the 100th anniversary, the centennial, the oldest, and no offense, but the oldest consulate in Nagoya by far, um, and sort of retracing our history and, and meeting people who were part of that process. I know we have a former uh, member of the consulate in the audience here today. And then getting to share that story with the people of Nagoya, we found it actually um, culminated. We did an exhibition at the Nagoya City Archives and getting to show the governor around and showing him the pictures of, of my predecessors and, and the different ways in which the consulate contributed to the community over the years. That was an immense pleasure. Um, I would also say being here at a time that Nagoya w really took off in, in so many ways economically. I can remember pre-COVID writing an article for the ACC Journal that was called Nagoya Rising. Because again, we passed Osaka economically. Um, the MRJ project was gonna take off. We have the uh, maglev coming in. So some of these things maybe have been sort of put on, the, put on the shelf for now, but others are going forward still. I remain impressed by the resilience you see in, in some of the companies here. So just having been a part of this and then finding out that, that Shinny is my distant cousin, 
Wow. Well, I mean, you know this is destiny being here. So, yes, it, it's really? truly been a pleasure. Yes, true story. French-Canadian ancestry. Amazing. Yes. <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> I forgot to mention something very important that we will take with us. It's the, the Japanese food, Japanese cooking. It was already part of our life. Even in, in Brazil, in the US, in London, we, we used to, to have uh, Japanese food at home. But now we have the addition of Nagoya, Nagoya cuisine. The, 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 as Gary said, the, the, the miso, the katsu, it's, it's delicious and it will be with us <laughs> for good. We will take this with us. Yeah. Great, thank you. So the next question. The number of foreigners coming to the Chuba region grew significantly over the past two decades, roughly 280,000 in the area. What do you see in the next decade post-COVID for the region in terms of growth for the foreign community? Well, we see the number of workers in Japanese plants increasing, so that's, that tendency is not going to change. Uh, so, so the numbers, if the numbers come from, uh, from somewhere, it'll be from that. It, it'll, it'll, and then, if it's beyond the plants, if it's anything new, it would be because of these major projects like building new industries that uh, that need to that attract uh, that attract foreign talent uh, that would need to happen uh, to see to to see some uh, some interesting growth in uh, in the number of foreigners the brazilian community is the largest in aichi it, it we, there are over 60,000 brazilians in, in in the prefecture and Education is their big challenge. Uh, how to integrate, how to, uh, uh, to be inserted in this society, how to acquire the tools to, to integrate. And, uh, because it's a, it's a peculiar community. They are mostly Nisei. They, they, they are Japanese, uh, uh, ethnically uh, look Japanese. They are seen as Japanese here, and that's a challenge for them because they cannot speak, they, they behave differently. So I think education is, is very important. Uh, and, but, but the thing is, I, I'm handling the, uh, the, the nitty-gritty. You have to think big to, to, to tackle the, 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 the big issues. If you want to shape the future, how these communities will uh, integrate and play a role in uh, shaping the, the face of Nagoya, the face of Aij. Uh, uh, it, it, you have to think big, you have to have plans, but it, it will not be a, a, a quick and easy solution. You, have to, you need a vision to, 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 to make these communities work uh, uh, towards a change, uh, to, towards enriching Nag uh, Nagoya or Aichi. It's, it's, it's a big challenge, but I think education is the thing to be watched. I've been struck um, by the fact that walking down the street, I feel like I see almost as many foreigners as I did pre-COVID. I think that speaks to the fact that our foreign population here is mostly folks who are working here, not tourists. Um, and that includes a large number of people who sort of straddle those two categories, these foreign trainees, right, the Kenshu say who are here. Those people are absolutely vital to industry, and I don't think that trend is, is going to change. However, uh, we, we did see this great plus up in the foreign community right when Mitsubishi uh, aircraft was sort of making its last uh, push to get, the, uh, to get the MRJ in the sky. I don't see something sort of... Uh, akin to that happening again in the near future, that we're gonna get something else that would suddenly replace that and lead to a, a sudden influx of the kinds of expats that came at, at, at that period in time, a lot of whom were headhunted from Bombardier or from Embraer, right? So we had that, uh, that certain demographic coming in. I, I don't see what would, in the near future would, would replace that. And then finally, I would agree with Ney uh, uh, on the whole issue of integration being just the, 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 the biggest challenge uh, facing Aichi as the prefecture that has the second largest foreign population after Tokyo, not a well-known fact. I am impressed by the steps that have been taken. Um, there are any number of um, 
consultative groups that bring together schools, local government. Um, definitely IHE, I think, is taking this problem very seriously uh, and devoting resources to it. The, the complaint that I hear at the working level is that I, I think uh, local governments here feel like that the national government is sort of leaving them to their own ends. You know, and there is a real costs associated with integration, having specialized teachers, having teachers of Japanese as second language. So I, I hope that that debate, that that discussion moves forward because as, as you know, as, as Ney says, that is the absolute critical issue. These, you know, these folks are here and uh, we have to find a way to integrate their kids and they can then become a, a source, a driver of economic growth uh, uh, later. But, you know, th th there are some, some issues that still have to be tackled. Do you think the national government can take any further steps in terms of immigration and, and rules and laws to, to help that? Shani? I think, I, I haven't studied the question that, uh, that, that long, so I can't offer you an expert opinion, but I, I, know, I know that uh, Japan could make it easier for uh, maybe their foreign students, and I'm talking about uh, uh, foreigners attending Japanese universities, to stay here after they graduate. Uh, easier for them to stay here and work and get their first work experience. I know that Canada does it, and, it, and I wouldn't be surprised if there are similar systems in the, in the US and in Brazil, but in Canada, uh, if you attend a, a Canadian university, uh, you can stay on for two or three years and work, and at some point, Canada generally makes it relatively easy for you to become a Canadian citizen. Of course, if you've been working and, and, and not committing any crimes or what have you. But generally, the, 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 the type of person that goes to a university and graduates seems like the ideal immigrant <laughs> in any country. It just comes and joins the workforce, it speaks a language, it learns at a relatively young age uh, the do's and don'ts of the society, they adapt. The people, uh, practically everyone I've met who's, who's come as a student, uh, not everyone, but all the great majority ended up liking the country and, and want, wanting to sort of, sort of fit in. They would seem like the, the, the ideal people to try and keep in the country but that'll be a decision uh, that'll be up to to the japanese to to make okay this is the last question i have what role do you think international schools and or internationalization in general will play in the economic growth of the chuba region nay well i i touched this point before i think uh especially a school like nagoya internationals who they are bringing uh, uh, ex exactly the points I raised before about uh, creating soul. They are b creating more creative people, uh, uh, people that are able to, to, to challenge the ideas, to, 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 to not accept the things, the convention so easily. So I think this, uh, uh, this kind of school is very important uh, if we are doing the exercise we have been doing here, which is to think about the future of Nagoya and how to revitalize uh, the city, the, the, the prefecture. I, I really think that uh, it's, it's a tremendous good asset to have a school like NIS in, in, uh, in Nagoya and in Aichi. To the extent that entrepreneurship and innovation are going to be drivers of future growth in this economy, you have to have an international school like NIS that cultivates those values. I don't want to ever hear again, as I mentioned earlier in response to one of the questions, someone saying, we can't have our lab here because we can't get world-class talent, right? The world-class talent should be coming out of Nagoya, right? And not necessarily something that we have to pull in. And that's where schools like NIS that you know, are going to inculcate those values and teach those skills are absolutely important. So I see an absolute, uh, a direct linkage uh, between the role of international schools and then fostering this, this creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship that pretty much everybody agrees is, is what the economy in Chuba needs going forward. Absolutely. Shania? Uh, my job at the consulate is to lead a team of, of uh, six people, and our main job is trade development. So we help Canadian companies connect with potential partners in Japan and do business here. And of course, Canadian companies are, cannot, no, no one uh, speaks Japanese. Um, you have the odd Nikkei or, or Japanese Canadian 
who want to do business in Japan, but the, those are exceptional. There are so few of them. So essentially, we need to we need to hire staff that knows how Canadians think, how they do business, and obviously who know how to speak their language. And those are are very interesting jobs. So so for as an employer, we we look for these type uh, of people. This. Uh, I was mentioning earlier that in order to build new industries in, in Aichi, it would be interesting to attract these anchor companies. If they come from Japan, good. These companies could come from foreign countries. Uh, in Montreal's case, we attracted a French design studio. If, if Aichi were to attract a major IT company from Germany or from, from France, from, from Spain or from the US to act as an anchor, you need, uh, you need some staff. Uh, you might want to hire them from Tokyo, but if you have the staff locally, why not? It just makes that uh, it makes things that much easier. So, in order to build new industries, in order to to increase trade between companies, uh, countries like Canada and, and Japan, to have uh, to have people who who have the, the set of skills that the students graduating from the school have, is a great asset for the region. Okay, well that wraps up today's event. I just want to say thank you very much to all three of you and wish you the best of luck on your, your next adventures outside of Nagoya. And we appreciate you taking part in this, uh, this event, our first event here at Nagoya International School. Thank you very much. I'd like to call back up to the stage Matthew Parr, the headmaster of Nagoya International School. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, so much for facilitating a you know, fantastic uh, discussion. And gentlemen, really, honestly, thank you. Um, it was just a joy, actually, to sit and listen. There was so much positivity from the discussion, which I think we thought that that was what you we were going to say. <laughs> we thought that it was going to be a positive angle, but it was really nice you know, to really hear it happen. I mean, it really seems that from your perspective, uh, you know, everything was primed for this, uh, this area to, to be so strong and so innovative and so creative and move forward with all the things that you were talking about before COVID. And I didn't really hear anything that tells you that COVID has stopped that. I mean, I think, uh, Gary, you mentioned that maybe put on the shelf for a while. There were symptoms of things that have been delayed, but that sort of basic DNA, the energy of this region um, is still very much there. Um, and then also, the, the, of course, as an educator myself, the discussions around education um, I, found, I found fascinating. And I, and I really do agree. You know, I think this model that you know, the international school is you know, just the school where the foreigners go. You, know, you, you bring in the foreigners and the foreigners need to go there. But it's this sort of temporary transient place. That's absolutely something that we do. That's a key part of what we do. And companies need to bring in talent so they need to know that they have that school. But it's also a part of being a part of the change for the local community as well. And that's something that I, that I heard you talking about, you know, this kind of innovation, this sort of creativity, these, these understanding of local context, understanding of, of language and culture and all of these things that are so important. And something that schools like NIS uh, can absolutely do. You know, I was reflecting as you were talking about that on, on, on Saturday, we have our, our graduation. And we're going to have these amazing young people, bilingual, bicultural. You know, they, 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 can, they can live and be at home here in, in Nagoya. They can live and be at home in many other countries around the world. Um, and the sad reality is that at the moment, most of those kids will probably not end up working in Nagoya. Most of them will be you know, headhunted to, to Tokyo or, or to cities overseas. And these are great people that could come and be here and be a part of the innovation and the change um, and the growth that, that you've been talking to. So, you know, I'm very excited by the Perspectives Discussion Series. I'm very excited by some of these conversations, um, bringing in different voices. You know, how can a school like NIS uh, partner more closely with our local neighbors, our local community? How can these educational ideas transfer? What can we learn from Japan? What can Japan learn alongside us? Um, and how can we also be a part of this positive change in this post-pandemic world? So it's been really exciting. It's been really creative. It's really got my brain firing a lot. And I'm really grateful on behalf of everyone at NIS. Thank you for being our guest panel on this first inaugural uh, discussion series. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.